Okay, so our second talk of the session is by Christian Narbenhams, and it is called Verifiable Fully Homomorphic Encryption. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, just wait until the slides are up. Yes, so I want to talk about uh, Verifiable uh, Fully Homomorphic Encryption. I am Christian. This is joint work with Alexander Vyar and Anwar Hitnawi, who are also in the audience today. Um, so I want to start by, by saying that, you know, in most FHE applications that we consider, uh, we usually make the assumption that the survey is semi-honest or honest but curious. Um, however, in many use cases, uh, in, especially in real-world applications, it's desirable and actually quite important um, to consider a malicious server, so a server that's allowed to arbitrarily deviate from the, from the computation. And there's, you know, a lot of uh, uh, reasoning behind this, so, you know, you might not be able to include a trusted server in your threat modeling, uh, for example, you know, when we use just transport lane security in our applications, we usually assume that the, the link, for example, is under the control of a malicious adversary. Uh, even if you trust your favorite cloud provider to be honest, there's always the case of breaches. Uh, there's always the, 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 the threat that you do programming errors. And so even if the, the server is honest, you still deviate from the protocol as intended. And finally, there's also monetary incentives. So you know the cloud might want to access your data to extract some value from it, or it might want, for example, to compute a function f that is cheaper than the one you, you specified. Uh, so for all these reasons, you know, we, we want to look a bit out how FHE fares in the context of a malicious adversary. And it's actually extremely brittle in this setting. So there's an, an obvious implication for correctness, right? So if the cloud can deviate from the protocol, then you have no guarantee about the results, so you lose the correctness guarantee of FHE. But maybe more importantly, uh, confidentiality is also at risk when you have this kind of uh, actively malicious adversary. So uh, in particular, the adversary can compute a malformed ciphertext, and what usually happens in these, in these uh, settings is that the client might react uh, to the ciphertext when receiving it. So it decrypts it, notices that something is wrong, and reacts in some, in some way. For example, sending back a warning, reissuing a query, uh, doing any other kind of reaction that the server can observe. And this behavior usually depends on the secret key, uh, if the, the ciphertext has been uh, tampered with in a smart way by the adversary. Uh, and so you know, this allows uh, very efficient key recovery attacks that have been known in the literature uh, for FHE for quite a while now. And so, you know, this kind of completely voids the confidentiality, the confidentiality guarantee that we want to use FHE for. Uh, so, you know, this is the kind of the, the goal. Uh, yeah, I should mention that uh, um, these attacks are also very hard to detect. So FHE doesn't really give you an interface to check whether a computation was done correctly or not. Uh, and this is a complete key recovery attack. So all the ciphertext you ever stored on the, on the cloud, for example, uh, can be trivially uh, decrypted by the adversary once the, the key is recovered. Uh, right, so, you know, this is the, the kind of the problems that we tried to address in a recent paper that we put out, uh, so both addressing this correctness and this confidentiality loss uh, in this malicious setting. And before diving a bit into the content of the paper, I wanna first talk about the, the challenges of uh, integrity for FHE and why this is still kind of an open problem now uh, more than, I don't know, 10, 10 years after FHE has really become uh, used. Um, and you know, the, the first issue is the, the level of abstraction we wanna operate on. So, Existing approaches, for example, use a very formal definition of FHE that's very abstract. FHE allows you to do arbitrary computation over ciphertexts. Some other works use a specific FHE scheme, so for example, the BV scheme, which is a very kind of early scheme, uh, and try to solve the integrity problem specifically for those. But both of these uh, you know, approaches, while they achieve a, a desirable level of generality, they, they fail uh, to, to capture some, some small notions and some small deviations that we see in modern FHE. So we really want to concentrate on the, the five schemes that people actually implement, that they use in practice, and that are currently undergoing ISO standardization. So this is the interface that you usually kind of think of when you, you program FHE, right? So you have your inputs at the top, you encrypt those, then you have an arithmetic circuit, and at the end you decrypt, and the result is equal to the uh, computation over the plain text. Now the first kind of deviation from this ideal view is that we have ciphertext plaintext inputs. This is something, for example, that we don't really have in traditional cryptography, and so if you try to port uh, existing solutions from traditional crypto to FHE, you're gonna have to deal with this problem. Similarly, we have the ciphertext maintenance operations that take evaluation keys, and due to secular security, these evaluation keys are actually encryptions of the secret key. Again, not something we see in classical crypto, and so when you try to formalize this problem and port existing solutions to the FHE setting, this is another issue that you're gonna run into. Uh, then we also have to drop the assumption that uh, the result is gonna be equal. Uh, for like approximate FHE, which is very useful for machine learning applications, for example. Uh, we have some, only an approximate guarantee here. Um, this is also an issue in practice because we know that, for example, CKKS is more brittle than exact schemes. 
this doesn't achieve in CKD security, and this is also becomes very relevant when we try to uh, add robustness. And then all these nice little gates seem very you know nice and algebraic, but in practice under the hood. Uh, oh, sorry, too early. So yeah, another issue is that people usually th thought of FHE, at least in the integrity literature, as just uh, kind of used in the outsourcing setting where the client has access to all the input side products. But in practice, FHE is very useful as well in two-party computation, multi-party computation, where the server is also contributing some inputs. For example, in machine learning, uh, the server would contribute some model weights, for example, and the client would contribute uh, the input to be uh, inferred. And again, this causes some obvious issue when you try to model this formally and when you actually try to implement uh, a protection in practice. And then now we come to the, to the gates. So they seem very nice and algebraic, but in the hood, they're heavily optimized. We use uh, NTTs, we use you know, sometimes some floating point operations there. We use some knowledge break operations, so for some rounding, for example. Uh, and this is gonna be an issue when we actually try to do this practically um, to, to add a um, uh, protection that is actually taking all of this into account. And finally, kind of an inherent issue with FHE is that this architects get pretty large, and so any solution will uh, run into, you know, inevitable scalability and efficiency challenges. So this is why kind of this is a very interesting problem to look at, but also how we, why we don't really have a solution uh, as of yet. So what people have been trying to do uh, in existing work is to start from this NCPA secure base FHE scheme. And one existing line of work uh, follows the, the paradigm of verifiable computation or VC um, from classical crypto and tries to adapt this for FHE. And so this gives you FHE with what we call circuit integrity. It basically gives you a guarantee that the computation was executed correctly on the server. Uh, so it gives you a correctness guarantee against some edge subversary, but it doesn't really uh, give you robust confidentiality. And the reason for this is that the, the, the threat model or the adversary considered here is actually allowed to be malicious, but only gets access to a verification oracle. And so the guarantees you get for confidentiality are basically um, equivalent to the ones you get for, for plain FHE. On the other hand, uh, some people have been trying to build in CCA1 secure FHE, so this is FHE that's secure against non-adaptive uh, chosen ciphertext stacks, um, again, using techniques from traditional cryptography. There, the goal is really to give confidentiality against a fully malicious adversary with access to a decryption oracle, but there's no um, kind of notion of correctness, so you don't get any more guarantee that confidentiality. You know you're not leaking to your secret key, um, but you don't know what you're getting back from the server. Uh, so we weren't super happy about this, uh, you know, this set of affairs, and so we uh, try to work towards a verifiable FHE, that achieves both correctness and confidentiality against this, this strong uh, malicious adversary setting with access to a decryption oracle. So this is kind of the, you know, kind of the, the formalism level, um, how do we define this formally? Um, and now let, let's look at how people have been trying to achieve this in practice and how we can kind of combine FHE with other primitives to, to get robustness. So on the VC side, uh, people have been using two main techniques. The first one is using zero knowledge proofs for cost evaluation, for example. And the second one is by using homomorphic methods, uh, method, message authentication codes um, that you would embed to prove correct computation. On the other hand, in CCA1 security, we get some more exotic constructions, for example, using uh, initial maturity obfuscation, um, and also some more classical paradigms from uh, traditional crypto, for example, the now young double encryption paradigm, where you take the, the you know, two different instances of your FHE scheme, you encrypt twice, you prove correct encryption, and then you also prove correct evaluation. So let's set aside the primitives that we don't really know how to realize in practice yet and don't, that don't really fit the schemes we, we want to look at. Um, how can we achieve verifiable FHE at the bottom? I mean, there's two obvious approaches that we see here, right? We could naively combine, uh, you know, a CCA1 scheme with a uh, FHE with second integrity scheme or, you know, do it the other way around. Uh, this, you know, looks ridiculous. This is obviously not the way forward. This is gonna be very hard to analyze and very hard to get, you know, any kind of uh, efficiency out of this. So instead, of what we found out uh, during our investigations is that you can actually just use an FHE scheme and a ZKP scheme to achieve uh, VFHE. This is like, it's quite surprising, right? Because we achieve a stronger uh, guarantee than by just using simpler, um, by using a simpler construction than, than the ones that achieve only, you know, a part of the problem. And uh, there are a few, few tricks we use to arrive there. So the first uh, starting point is to see that um, the existing approaches really use techniques from classical crypto and ported them in a black box manner to FHE. Whereas we kind of, by inspecting how FHE works under the hood and the guarantees we actually get in practice, we are able to get this simple construction. So 
instead of starting from just the NTP, uh, NTPA security, we actually have a stronger notion uh, called NTPAD, introduced by Liam Michancho. Uh, this is basically equivalent to NTPA for exact schemes, and uh, CKKS, for example, can be strengthened to achieve NTPAD security. And so by reducing CCA1 to CKD security, we can actually get rid of this double encryption paradigm. We can just use one encryption scheme with no DKP. So this is kind of the, the first trick we use. Um, the second trick is to simplify the setup that's assumed in the VC literature. In the VC literature the, that works over unencrypted data, there's usually a, a lot of parties. So there's a source, there's a target, there's a verifier, and there's an evaluator. Uh, and all of these parties kind of can collude in different ways. But what we see in kind of the typical client server uh, protocols for FHE, there's usually one entity with a, a secret key and access to the data and one evaluating entity. Uh, and so we can kind of collapse all these uh, entities on the left to one single entity. The benefit here is that the, for example, the verifier knows that the uh, ciphertexts were encrypted correctly because it was the same entity. And the third trick we use is that um, we simplify the assumptions on the CCA1 side. So in, in CCA1 security, they use a very kind of rigid formal model of FHE where you know you just get the key generation, encryption, evaluation, decryption. But as we've seen before, uh, these ciphertext plain text operations are actually much more efficient than just ciphertext ciphertext operations in practice. And so by, you know, in practice, the server will actually use only plain text inputs for efficiency, but by, you know, incorporating this into our formal model, we also get rid of a proof of correct encryption. Uh, and we just need to prove that this W is a valid plain text instead of proving that it's a valid plain text and the correct encryption and that the public key and some correctly generated model. So these are the three insights we use to kind of get to this simpler construction. Uh, with this in mind, you know, the, the construction is actually quite straightforward. So the key generation is just a key generation phase for the FHE scheme and one for the ZKP scheme. Uh, the encryption is just a standard FHE encryption. The evaluation takes some ciphertext from the client together with the plain text inputs from the server that can be maliciously uh, chosen. We do the FHE evaluation as before, and then we add a verification tag that is actually a proof. So first of correct evaluation, and additionally a proof that W is a valid plain text. Uh, so we also looked at some extensions. For example, if you use a zero knowledge proof, you can actually hide the, the server inputs from the client. You know, and this kind of uh, fits nicely with the function privacy um, definition of uh, FHE. And you can actually add additional checks on the plain text input uh, from the server. So for example, you can prove that the server input uh, is the opening or opens to a previous commitment that was made uh, earlier in the protocol, or you can prove that W satisfies, you know, some other properties of our application specific. And then finally, uh, at the end of the protocol, the client just uh, verifies that the tag and the suffix match and then does the FHE decryption. Right, so this is kind of the, the simplified uh, theoretical notion of how I combine an FHE scheme and a ZKP scheme together to achieve this, this robustness uh, guarantee. Uh, now, this is not the end of the story, right? This blue box looks um, deceptively simple. We just prove correct evaluation of a ciphertext. This is actually non-trivial in practice. Uh, so we wanted to do the, you know, go to the next step and see how we can ach actually achieve this in practice. And for this, we, we looked at several instantiations of our proof system. Uh, so first we looked at the hardware primitive, so we tested execution environments, and then we looked at more traditional uh, cryptographic proofs. In particular, we kind of look at two, two subdivisions of, of proofs, um, field-based proofs, which are kind of the traditional you knowledge proofs you might be used to, and some more recent, more advanced ring-based proof, which work more, ni more, more nicely with, um, with the FHE. I've mentioned homomorphic maps a few times before. Uh, these don't really fit this proof system approach. Um, they are quite efficient in practice, but they don't allow for server input, so I'll, I'll put them aside at the moment, uh, but I'm happy to take some, some more uh, questions on, on them later. All right, so you know, this is the view that, that we've implicitly assumed uh, up until now, and that is usually made in the literature for integrity uh, for FHE. You have an FHE scheme and a ZKP scheme and you can naively you know, combine them together and everything works nicely. And this is true for you know, the, the TE approach, for example, because in the end your FHE application is just gonna be a binary that you can also run on the enclave instead of a normal TPU. But when you try to use cryptographic proofs, uh, this breaks down a bit. So FHE space over lattices uses this big polynomial ciphertexts. Um, it has usually composite moduli for efficiency, whereas the ZKPs, for example, many of the ZKPs work over uh, nice big elliptic curves fields, uh, where you, your modulus is prime, and so there's a mismatch between these two primitives. And so to bridge the gap, there's a very expensive emulation step that's required in between. 
we just translate from the FHE statements that we want to prove to the kind of ZKP interface that we're given. And I just want to run you quickly through, uh, you know, a very quick example of FHE to ZKP translation and emulation and see how expensive this can get in practice. So let's start with just a simple uh, FHE multiplication. So, you know, uh, working over, um, you know, for example, BGV here, uh, this is just a multiplication, so just a tensoring without really and without anything else. So under the hood, this translates to, you know, a tensoring operation, so four multiplications and one addition over these uh, elements, which are polynomials. Um, by, you know, in practice, we use the NTT, so we decompose this uh, multiplication of uh, polynomials as a, uh, you know, uh, plotwise uh, multiplication of vectors. Then if we go down one level, we can actually, um, we can actually express this as n concatenation of a circuit that does multiplications over these uh, integers uh, in ZQ. Uh, you can think of n here as being, you know, several thousands. Going down further, we can use the, the double um, RNS decomposition, so go down one level to a prime field where QI here is prime. Again, introducing like a, a 10 times overhead, uh, roughly in the, the, the amount of circuits we have to use. And then we also need to emulate this small prime field with the big prime field that we're given for the ZKP. Uh, we can do this by optimizing, by inserting modulus gates, basically after each operation. Uh, in practice, we can uh, actually optimize this a bit so we can uh, push out the modulus gates just until, uh, just before we overflow the, the ZKP modulus, but you still need to, to do this expensive emulation. And actually, this modulus gates also needs to be emulated in practice, so you have to kind of uh, have the prover provide additional inputs, so provide, for example, a quotient and a remainder, and then each of these uh, comparison gates also needs to be emulated over your ZKP arithmetic using, for example, bit decomposition and bitwise comparison. So, you know, this gives you kind of a, an idea of the overhead that's required just to prove a, a very simple multiplication of FHG ciphertext using, you know, your, your, Z, your ZKP uh, of choice. So wouldn't it be nice if we had something, you know, like this, like a ZKP that works much more nicely with the FHP team. And this also has uh, some additional benefits. Um, for example, we have these very nice uh, hardware accelerators uh, for FHE, you know, ranging from GPUs all the way to the very heavyweight um, accelerators from the DARPA d Fry project. And so if we have a, a ZKP that actually works on the same rings and on the same kind of underlying math libraries in FHE, we can na na uh, natively accelerate both at the same time. So the state of the art um, in this area is a paper called Vinocchio that uh, provides snarks for arbitrary rings. Um, it still has a few kind of um, open open issues, uh, open problems. Uh, the, the paper doesn't come with an implementation, so we actually uh, provide an implementation of the uh, Vinocchio scheme. There's also some uh, inefficiency in the uh, encodings used for the inner proofs. Uh, so by using uh, batching techniques from FHE, we can very nicely have a significant speed up there, uh, but there's still kind of some, some open um, questions that the assumption made there is kind of non-standard in the ZKP world. The soundness is also limited to the parameters we choose for FHE schemes. We have to repeat the proof a few times to get a satisfying level of soundness. Right, so these are kind of the primitives we looked at. So uh, on the one side, first the execution environment, then kind of uh, standard field-based ZKP proofs, and then this uh, more modern ring-based ZKP proofs. So, um, how do we evaluate it in practice? We uh, chose a few FHE, cipher, uh, sort of FHE applications, FHE circuits. We implement those in uh, you know, SEAL um, for, for library for backend. And then we also implement this emulation step or the constant generation in a few uh, domain specific languages for the knowledge proofs. So we use uh, CIRCOM for a few backends. We use uh, a Rust specification for bullet proofs. And we also use our own implementation of Vinocchio. I just want to present kind of the, one of the circuits we implement, um, which is relatively simple. So here we just uh, subtract two ciphertexts and compute the square. Uh, for example, this could be computing um, you know, an Euclidean distance, and then we also insert the mod switching at the end before decrypting. And we, uh, yeah, so the check that I mentioned before, the, the plain text check is actually just a validity range check, so a range proof, um, and then we do kind of a, um, a proof that the NTT was computed correctly on this plain text, so that the, the input to the um, subtraction date is actually in the NTT form. And we also wanted to have some noise flooding, so to provide uh, you know, some privacy uh, um, regarding the, the server input, uh, we chose a very simple uh, you know, noise flooding approach where the client provides some encryption of zeros, um, the server provides some bits, 
and the server basically chooses uh, some noise to add to the computation at the end. And here we just need to check that these are uh, actually bits provided by the server. And so this is the, the actual SHE computation. Um, you can see this is very simple, one multiplication, one uh, subtraction gate uh, circuit in FHE translates to around um, you know, six million constraints. Uh, you can think of constraints as like the, the main uh, driving cost in ZKPs. This is uh, the thing that's gonna you know, decide your approval time, your vacation time, your um, common reference strings in most approaches. But if we use like a, a ZKP over rings, we can actually express this entire subcircuit in just three constraints uh, over 0.9 years. Uh, and then you know, the, for the other elements uh, are similarly expensive to, to emulate and to express in, in the field based ZKP. Uh, they're much more expensive to emulate compared to the, the, the circuit for the ring based ZKP. And it's gonna become relevant a bit later. Um, but so in total, you see uh, this entire circuit takes uh, 550 constraints to kind of express uh, over a ring ZKP and around 16, mil uh, 16 million constraints in a you know, standard field based ZKP. Uh, now for some timing, this is something that's practical yet. Uh, so first, let's look at the, the kind of specific implementation that we use. We use Intel SGX for RTE. Uh, for the field ZKPs, we look at a few different ones. So Boolean proofs on Aura and uh, Graphic Steel, which is kind of the, the, the system we, we want to propose. And uh, we use Binocchio for our ring ZKP. And we actually use some very uh, kind of coarse divisions for the timing. So we say something is practical if it takes on the orders of seconds. Uh, it's acceptable if it takes some, some minutes and then impractical if it takes on the order of hours. So we're really concerned with applications that are not latency critical. Um, and we just wanna see kind of how, how practical robust FHE really is. So these, this is the complete timing for kind of a, a one round interaction. So key generation uh, at the client, then uh, evaluation and proof at the server, and then again, uh, proof verification and uh, decryption decoding at the client. So for FHE, uh, this takes around one second for the, the circuit that I've shown before. Uh, SJX gives you pretty good performance. So we see kind of a four times um, slowdown compared to just unprotected FHE. Um, bullet proofs on Aurora give you, uh, you know, very high overhead. Uh, graphic scene and Ronyoko both give you kind of an acceptable overhead. And if we look specifically at all the, the cryptographic uh, proofs, uh, we can actually split these times a bit more into a one-time setup, uh, and then the proving phase and the verification phase. So bullet proofs on Aurora, also called uh, transparent uh, Zonage proofs, that means they don't have a uh, one-time setup at the expense of a very, uh, very, very slow verification phase. Whereas both Gothic Scene and Minocchio uh, have a pre-processing phase that uploads a lot of the computation to a you know, one-time per circuit pre-processing uh, in exchange get constant verification time. So for example, for Gothic Scene, the verification time is uh, smaller than for you know, FHE decoding uh, and uh, is actually you know, is constant, so it won't grow with your size takes. Uh, and same for Minocchio. Here, the, the verification time is just a bit bigger because we operate in these big polynomial uh, elements which, which constitute the proof. Uh, I've mentioned before in practice, so the Renocchio, most of the overhead comes from these uh, constraints that come from the noise flooding and from the input check, uh, but as the circuit grows, for example, uh, you know, we would only add marginally more um, constraints uh, to the system. Okay, so some more kind of uh, qualitative uh, overview. For the small circuits we, we implement, uh, for, you know, TE is very practical. Any kind of field-based EKP that is transparent is gonna be completely impractical. Um, and then as soon as you have some pre-processing step, you can get into an acceptable regime of overhead. Uh, but as we scale to bigger circuits, you will run into some issues for the, the TE side, for example, running into limited memory. Uh, and so there you will need to, to have some other strategy. And we conjecture that um, you know, even pre-processing uh, snarks that are based on field will become impractical because of this blow up in emulation. Uh, and so the really kind of the, the, the future we see uh, where more work is needed has been uh, ring-based EKPs, and specifically we think pre-processing is kind of a, a starting point where we'll uh, hopefully see some, some more uh, acceptable performance overhead. This brings me to my takeaway, so if you remember nothing else from this talk, uh, please remember this slide. Uh, if you, you know, can you know, get away with using non-robust FHE, if you host your own server or you, you have complete trust in your service provider, then use this by all means. Then if you trust your TE, if you have you know, this hardware trust that you can uh, incorporate in your threat model, if you have some uh, developers on hand that know how to code for TEs, um, use those, it will give you like a two to 10 times overhead. 
if you don't have that and want to rely on cryptography, um, if you have a relatively simple application, for example, that doesn't use approximate FHE or that doesn't have server inputs, uh, you should use FHE together with homomorphic max. They're gonna give you an acceptable overhead of two to 40 times. Uh, this is some other work that uh, I've done together with uh, some people from the CFL, Sylvain here, so happy to take some questions on that as well. And you know, any kind of full-fledged application that uses approximate FHG or server inputs, you will need to go uh, to the ZKP uh, regime, and this will give you a significant overhead, uh, but we hope to reduce this uh, you know, in the future. Right, so uh, just to mention, we have a paper up on archive. We also have uh, some code that's open source, uh, so you can you know, feel free to play around with it. And I'm happy to hear your thoughts and comments and questions. Okay, so any questions? In this case, are the uh, constraints in R1CS, or are they? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Have you experimented with any, I might have asked this a moment ago outside, but with any folding schemes that use something like a relaxed R1CS, or is there a better constraint system possibly that might help out uh, reducing? So we look both at um, AIR and at Plonk. Uh, for example, Plonk gives you, uh, allows you to define some, some low level um, uh, you know, polynomial gates. However, for us, that would be, for example, the modulus, which has you know, like 60, degree 60, so this is not really feasible. Maybe with newer hyperplonk techniques, this might be able, you know, you might be able to shave some, some of that off, but I mean, you still have this inherent issue that you need to emulate uh, an entire you know, field, uh, ring computation over a finite field. And the same for AIR, where you have this, this kind of uh, transition states will still be very high degree polynomials. This question, I have one more question that's a little bit more far-fetched. Is there a fundamental reason why Starks and fry based systems wouldn't work? Uh, so my understanding is that they are, uh, like Roth 16 is really the more the most performant you can get at the moment. Uh, Starks have some other benefits uh, that are useful in, for example, blockchain applications. I think in this two-party setting, Roth 16 is really, like this kind of pre-processing snark uh, is, the thing that we, we mean uh, for FHG at the moment. So we, not for the, the kind of application we consider. There might be some application in blockchain, but the performance is gonna be much worse than what we present here. Interesting, thank you. Um, does your new definition imply the other two definitions that you showed on slide 12 or does that question even make sense? Uh, yeah, so I mean, our definition is basically encompasses in TC1 security for symmetric FHE. Um, for VC, it's a bit more complicated because there is a completely different formalism. So there you don't have encryption, you have problem generation, uh, everything. So these are kind of incomparable. But we use the same correctness, basically, if we, we take it out for VC and extract it to the FHE setting. Hello, uh, what do you think about uh, using stacks as a proving system? I think this goes into the, the question that I had earlier. I think um, we have the advantage of having, for example, in FHG, you have a uh, pre-processing step. You have a trusted uh, generator, right? It's, the client does a key generation phase, and so we can take advantage of that to do uh, you know, a one-time TRS generation, uh, and Roth 16 is you know, the, most, the most performance you can get under these assumptions, and so going to the stacks will only, you know, give us uh, worse performance, no additional benefits. Okay, since we're a little bit behind time, we'll, we'll leave it there. So let's thank Christian again.